I was 20 years old with two children um, under the age of three, and I, I either had the choice of working two jobs and trying to support my kids or helping another family experience the joy that I was experiencing. I thought it was just the best of both worlds to be able to be the one to raise my kids and uh, stay at home with them. It's easy for me to have children. And just the thought that there are people that couldn't have children or that struggled to have children was just something that really touched me. Infertility is an age-old problem. It's been with us since almost the beginning of time. Up until the 1970s, there was really little that medicine or technology could offer people that were struggling to have a child. But with the birth of Louise Brown in the late 1970s, this whole new field of reproductive technology was born. I'm very sympathetic to people that can't have children, that want to have children. And I really appreciate the fact that when people are faced with dealing with infertility, that that's a loss. But on the other hand, we have to look at, at what costs and at what extreme or what limits might be in place to allow people to fulfill those inborn desires that they have. I remember as a young nurse when I was working in the hospital, the male nurses used to always just refer to the women as breeders. And then when we interviewed Gail, uh, one of the surrogates, she was talking about when she got into the legal custody battle for the children that she went on and conceived. She was a surrogate for her brother. And the lawyer that was representing her brother in the custody battle for the children said something to the effect like, we just need to change the law and the law needs to recognize that some women are just gonna be used as breeders. What we see when you look outside of the United States, particularly in India or Thailand or Mexico where there's really growing surrogacy markets with women who are just desperately poor um, they're really treated like breeders. I've known Marvin since the mid-90s. We went out a few times, you know. Uh, we quickly found out there wasn't any real spark for romance. We weren't in any serious relationships, and we both wanted desperately to be parents. My brother and, and his partner and I were uh, down in Mexico. We were on the beach eating, and a same-sex couple came by and had two little children. When they started discussing their situation that um, their sister had uh, given birth to them uh, with each of their sperm. I s said I would donate my egg at that time, but I would not carry the children. And over the next 18 months, they tried to uh, convince me to do this. They asked me if I would actually carry the children. I got online and saw that there were websites where you could post your own advertisement as a surrogate and there were a lot of other ads out there and I just kind of threw one up there and to see what would happen and I was actually contacted by a lady who lived in my area. She had donor eggs with her husband's sperm. They had frozen embryos and she just needed somebody to carry them. We got along great and we transferred two embryos and it was the best experience. It was amazing. I gave birth to twin girls. She had paid me 15,000 um, in monthly increments. Just after a year after giving birth to the twins, I gave birth to my own daughter. And it was a couple of years later that I was faced with the decision to go back to work, uh, working many hours or staying at home with my children. And I had such a wonderful, beautiful experience with surrogacy that I thought, why wouldn't I do it again? I did post another ad and I made contact with another woman in my area and we had met shortly after and I thought it was a good match and we started to move forward. I learned that there were two types of surrogacy, that you could do it with your own biological child or that you could do it with, you know, an egg donor or someone else's egg. And at first I considered gestational surrogacy because then it wouldn't be biologically my child. I wouldn't have a connection to it and it seemed like that would, be, that would make it easier. As I researched that process, though, I learned a lot about the medications that you take to be a gestational surrogate. I just have always kind of been more of a natural, holistic type of a person, so the, the idea of putting those types of things into my body didn't sit well with me. I only wanted to do it for a gay couple and not a heterosexual couple because I just didn't think that I could separate from that mom role. Gail's story, when I heard it, really resonated with me because something I hear a lot in my travels and speaking is, well, I would be a surrogate for my girlfriend. I would be a surrogate for my sister in a heartbeat. 
And so while a lot of people don't think we should just be, you know, stranger surrogates out there and just meeting up on websites and going off to India to find a surrogate, the argument is we'll keep it, you know, amongst friends and family. So Gail's case is unique because that's exactly what her story was. She decided as a, a woman in her 40s who'd never had children before to move from her home in Texas up to New Jersey and be the surrogate for her, her brother and his partner. Because of her age, they ended up having to use donor eggs as well. One day he said something like, what would you say to being a stay-at-home mom and financially secure in your own home? And I didn't quite know what he meant by that because we were obviously not romantically involved. Um, and I started questioning him. At one point, he finally suggested, well, why don't, why don't we write it down? Why don't we each write down what we expect from this? I wrote down my questions that I had for him. Did you mean as a married couple in a normal relationship? Did you mean as a married couple in a platonic relationship for the sake of children? Did you mean artificial insemination or IVF? That formed a pattern of me providing information that I, I can look back on now and him providing the bare information. He never wrote anything down. We just continued to discuss things and I came to understand you know, that no, he didn't mean marriage. He didn't mean living together. Um, and my understanding was that it would be me having the baby or babies, me being a stay-at-home mom, and him providing the financial um, support for that. Our goal is to connect people around parenting partnerships, the idea of finding the right parenting partner for themselves. I've uh, been working in the, uh, the modern family space uh, for some time in terms of my own research interests, but also it so happened that it uh, connected with my personal interests uh, when I hit my mid-30s. Um, I figured, or at least I thought, that when I was uh, by my mid-30s, I would be settled down, I'd have a partner, you know, be have 2.2 kids and a white picket fence and uh, all of those good things. Um, but, you know, I uh, found myself turning 35, 36 and um, still single. So what Family by Design does is it uh, introduces people to the concept of uh, perhaps finding the right person to become a parenting partner with. What a parenting partnership looks like is exactly the way that the parents want it to look like. So there's not a, a one-size-fits-all concept. Uh, I have seen parenting partnerships where they choose to move in together. Uh, and if they're non-romantic, maybe they have separate bedrooms, but they're both still present in the household. Or maybe one lives a block away. Or maybe one lives a couple miles away. There are a number of clients who are going to end up using surrogates for a number of reasons. Um, one common uh, reason may be that uh, heterosexual couple may end up having issues and so therefore she doesn't have the capacity to carry a pregnancy on her own. She may have medical conditions that prevent her from conceiving. For same-sex couples, male same-sex couples, then surrogacy is their only option. I tend to, to joke and talk about the, you know, the Liz Lemon uh, syndrome, if you will. You know, the idea that women and men are spending a longer period of their lives um, working on their careers, uh, working on their self-development, travel, life experiences, and so in doing so, they often tend to push off family development and family responsibility until later in their lives. In our program, what we do, and I spend a lot of time talking to patients about, is just that there are a lot of reasons why you might choose to do this um, in terms of needing to use a surrogate. Uh, but the most important thing is to make sure you're protected because what we do is we will always actually let you know that our role, our plan, our um, mission is to basically have you build your family and create your family. It's not to create someone else's family, it's to create your family. Shortly after meeting, we went in to see the fertility doctor and we got the process started. We had transferred two embryos. I got pregnant with a singleton. The pregnancy was great. During an ultrasound, there was shown that there was no nasal bone that she had echogenic bowel, that there were a lot of very significant signs of Down syndrome. At that point, mom had gotten up and left me in the doctor's office and she had walked out and I was crushed. For that pregnancy, they had compensated me 20,000. As now an experienced surrogate, surrogates are able to ask a little more. They were wonderful about it. They, when she was born, they gave me the rest of what she owed because she was born early. You know, it wasn't something I asked for. 
it was discussed uh, several times that they would uh, pay me twenty-two thousand uh, dollars to do this, and I had told them that I didn't want any money. The baby doesn't care anything about the money. That's not what hurts the baby. The baby is hurt by the separation, by the loss of that mother that it that it knows. All the money being exchanged is just terrible because you're you're making children into commodities. You could almost say it's a form of slavery or something, you know, buying and selling them. I'm a product of a traditional surrogacy. The parents I grew up with couldn't conceive together. My dad was my biological dad, but the mom I grew up with was my adopted mom. I found when I was 26 my birth mom. As much as I do believe that surrogacy can come from a compassionate place, as a product of surrogacy, it's hard not to be aware that there is a price tag. There is an awareness that, you know, in essence you were bought by the family that you grew up with. You are a product at the end of the day. In the United States, a large percentage of women who decide to become surrogates are military wives. The military wife fits the profile. Surrogates are usually required to have already had children because they can prove and demonstrate that they can successfully carry a child to term. Military wives often marry young and they have their children and they're of low income. The ads show and talk about how they're doing this wonderful thing, helping somebody have a child. Their husbands are out of the country overseas, and it's a great way for them to make twenty or $30,000 staying at home, being a good mom to their little children, and it's much needed money. For this film, we actually reached out to a military wife who'd done many surrogate pregnancies, and she had agreed to come. We'd booked her airfare, we had her hotel all lined up, so she contacted me and said that she wasn't able to come and would not be able to be in the film because she had spoken with her husband about it and she talked with several of the families that she'd been a surrogate for and they didn't want her to be in a film. Tanya had a similar experience. During her surrogate pregnancy, she was very active on a lot of the blogs and the chat rooms where surrogates will talk about their pregnancies and how things are going and you know get advice. And she started expressing concerns about whether or not the decision she'd made was a good one. She got a lot of pushback to the point where eventually her comments were removed and blocked and she was taken down off of the chat room so and wasn't even able to engage. So if anybody raises any kind of a question that things aren't all right, it gets a lot of pushback from the industry and the people that seek to make a lot of money off of surrogacy. When money and contracts get involved in the creation of a child, uh, what often happens when things go wrong is that the law has to step in. Obviously, buying and selling children in the literal sense, there was a ring in California where women were becoming pregnant before any families had been identified to place those babies and, the, and they were being sold. That seems like a clear case of selling babies. If you listen to proponents of surrogacy, they point to states like Illinois where you can circumvent the entire adoption framework, which has all kinds of quality assurance and safeguards built into it. Concerns that are meant to get at the problem of selling babies. There have been serious concerns raised about the disparate impact on poor people because rich people can afford in many instances to circumvent the adoption framework and find a surrogate, execute the agreement, get the baby without all kinds of process in place to try to protect the best interests of the child. California courts have said there's no relationship between adoption and, and gestational surrogacy. The gestational carrier really is a kind of vessel. There are real worries when money is involved. We were left with three healthy embryos and we ended up transferring all three of them and I did get pregnant with one. Everything was great up until about eight or nine weeks and we lost the baby. With this pregnancy, like the last, they were paying me a certain amount each month, but once we lost the baby, the payment just stopped. So at this point, um, being that we were out of embryos, I said, I, I will continue to move forward with you if that's what you decide. Mom did decide to go ahead and do another egg retrieval and create more embryos. So we transferred two and we knew they were boys. Everything was great and we went to the doctor at about eight or nine weeks and there was only one heartbeat. We had lost one of the boys. I started giving myself shots 
um, and taking the medications, preparing for artificial insemination. Unfortunately for me, my hormone levels dropped and therefore they didn't actually do the insemination. So we decided to try again. The doctor said, well, because of your age now, um, we really would recommend that you use donor eggs. We're at the clinic. We went through the donor book. We chose a donor that doesn't look anything like me, but we like what she had to say in her profile. The first IVF cycle was on November 1st, 2011. It was unsuccessful. We almost quit at that point, but Marvin and I talked about it, and we decided that we would do one more try. He was like, well, maybe we should just get a surrogate. And I'm like, well, we could do that. I wouldn't have a problem with that. We did the IVF on January 10th for the second time, and um, two weeks later, I went to have the test done, and it was a positive uh, pregnancy test. At the very beginning, it, uh, our relationship was was good. Um, we expected a happy ending. Once I became pregnant, the relationship between my brother and I uh, became very tense. About a month after the pregnancy, it completely fell apart. My brother was consistently telling me that I was fat, uh, that uh, I was lazy. At one point, he made me go mow, mow a yard at four months pregnant with twins. He wanted me to paint the house and it blew up. As I was leaving, um, getting in the car, he asked, uh, what about the, the babies? And I said that uh, we were going to be lucky if, you know, because of the stress that was going on. And he s turned around to me and said, well, I'll get some other stupid female to have my children. Sean called me and uh, asked if he could talk to me. We met and he suggested that I have an abortion and that I could go back to Texas. Uh, he actually said that this was not going how they had planned it and that they would get another surrogate to have their children. We went in for another ultrasound and the ultrasound tech got very quiet and wasn't really saying much, wasn't answering any questions and she just said, I'm gonna go get the doctor, I'll be right back. And at that point we knew something was wrong. So the doctor had come in and she took over and started scanning. And she pretty much looked at us and said, I don't really know how to explain this to you in terms that you're gonna understand right now, but there's something wrong with his brain. And at that point, mom got up and walked out and left me there again. I was devastated, not only for me, but for her, for the baby. I was so mad at her for walking out and leaving me there to deal with feelings that I shouldn't have been dealing with. It wasn't my baby. We did find out that he was diagnosed with a unilateral open lip schizencephaly um, on the left side of his brain. We went and met with the neurologist. The neurologist, you know, put up pictures of the scan and pretty much said, it doesn't look good. I mean, he's missing a pretty large portion of his brain. Every case is different. He may be just fine and you won't know until he's older. Of course, mom was very emotional when we we're leaving the appointment and I hugged her and I told her, it's your decision what you want to do, whether or not we're going to continue the pregnancy. Looking back, I regret that. A gestational carrier has twins, one of them has Downs, so therefore you may be faced with an issue that an intended parent does not want to have a child affected with Downs and would then suggest or recommend that um, the pregnancy be affected so therefore you can reduce uh, the infant with Downs and carry a singleton. If the gestation of carrier disagrees, that may cause problems. We did an ultrasound, discovered that I was having two babies. There were two definite heartbeats, and it was a, a miracle to me. I was like, oh my God, that's their heartbeats. We were at the clinic, and one of the people we were talking to said something about the high cost of high-risk pregnancy, especially for multiples, and he panicked. I mean, he's like, Oh my God, you know, I thought he knew what the costs would be. It floored me that he was so shocked at how much it might end up being. And he says, well, you need to apply for Medicaid. For a couple spending this kind of money to have to go through potentially both an egg donor cycle and a gestational surrogacy cycle, uh, it's very, very expensive. You know, we sort of joke about it and say everybody likes a sale. But it's, you know, you get two for the price of one. It's a very difficult, emotionally draining process for people to go through. And I can certainly see why they wouldn't want to do it more than once. 
typically the agency may charge between eight and ten thousand dollars. That's what I presume. Since we're not involved, I don't know. The cost of the entire surrogacy cycle may be between forty and seventy or hundred thousand dollars. That's whether it's one child or two. So therefore, having twins seems like a modest balancing in that realm. Because a surrogate is typically healthy and has low risk for complications, carrying twins is not out of the realm of being abnormal. There are many people that are concerned about surrogacy, and when you get involved in talking about the ethics and the risk to women, it brings together a diverse group of people. We sat down with Mona Lisa Wallace in San Francisco at the Women's Building. It's also been reported that as many as four or five embryos will be implanted in these industrial human farms. So the women who are experiencing these multiple pregnancies have a far increased risk of maternal death. They did decide to terminate the pregnancy. The doctor who had done the initial ultrasound actually agreed to do the termination herself. I needed to kind of keep my space for a little bit. I had a decision to make too. Yes, it was their child, but it was my body and the procedure was being done on me. It felt very heavy, very heavy. It dawned on me that ultimately it was my decision. I'm the one who had to give consent to take this little boy's life. I'm also a mother. You know, what would I do for my own child? I actually talked to a doctor, it's like the world-renowned schizencephaly expert. This doctor had said, after seeing the scans, that there's no reason this little boy wouldn't walk or talk or live a pretty normal life. And at that point I said, that's it. I don't decide who lives and dies. I, I can't do it. I can't live with myself knowing that I took this little boy's life from him. They had been trying to contact me. I was just taking a step back and I told her I couldn't do it. I, I just, I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't do it. And dad was on the phone and dad told me that I was going to suffer spiritual consequences for not obeying their decision. And I thought, how cruel. You know, I have to live with my own spiritual consequences too. And for me, the good Lord decides who lives and dies, not me. And I was okay with my decision and knowing that if God wanted this little boy, God would have taken him. That it wasn't my right to take it. I was at 21 weeks, so we literally had just a couple of weeks to make a decision because the state law at 22 weeks, you are no longer able to perform an abortion. And I think part of me was just kind of waiting for that window to close before I started speaking with them again. I did get an attorney at that point as they had gotten an attorney as well. We never started out with the contract. Contracts kind of always came in at the end. The pregnancy continued on. They made it very clear they didn't want this baby. And so I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I couldn't take this baby home. A woman had stepped up and said, we want him. I have another little boy with the same condition and we want him. I wanted to be able to go back to them and said, yes, this is a decision I made to, to keep the pregnancy. But if you don't want him, here's somebody who does. The lawyer started making contact and then they said, you know, we, we want him. He's our son, we're gonna take him. I was consistently tired. I gained weight immediately. And within probably about three months, I really couldn't wear shoes. At the end of the, the pregnancy, I gained about 20 pounds. It was either in a week period or a two week period. I woke up uh, in the middle of the night and I, I couldn't breathe. Uh, I couldn't see. I couldn't see in color. I could see things around, but I couldn't read or I couldn't see my, you know, the numbers on my phone to call. I went downstairs and out on the porch and I just started screaming for help because I, I couldn't call. So the people downstairs uh, called the ambulance for me. When they got there, uh, I was conscious. I did speak to them. I asked for oxygen. They did give me oxygen. I remember saying that it's not on and I kept turning the button. We walked out to the uh, ambulance and as I w was uh, getting up on the steps, I the last thing I remember saying, I said, I can't believe you're making me walk. And I don't remember anything else. I lost consciousness and I don't remember anything till the next evening when I uh, woke up. The babies were born uh, 
two weeks premature. I had an emergency cesarean. I had three doctors in the emergency room, from what I understand. They came by to see me later. One said that I was minutes away from death. The other one said I was in coma and having seizures. And one said that I was the worst case that they had ever seen. I was so miserable and sick. Um, and Marvin had insisted that I meet with his attorney to sign a document just in case something should happen to me during childbirth. I finally gave in. It said things like I agreed not to leave Texas um, if I got all hormonal and decided I needed to escape or whatever, that I wouldn't object to a Marvin being in the hospital with the babies, and that I wouldn't start drinking alcohol or using illegal drugs, that sort of thing, or smoking cigarettes, which I don't do any of those things anyway. And it had one phrase in there that had a weird word in it, and that's what caught me later, because I agreed to sign the form just to get out of there. I just wanted to go home and rest. So I finally signed this document, and the one word that it had in there was a phrase that said something like, I hadn't been paid anything for my services. I looked at that, and I thought that was weird, but it wasn't services, and that's what ended up giving them a foothold on claiming that I'm not the mother. They used that document later, after the children were born, to uh, claim that that was a surrogacy agreement. All it was was a sworn statement. It was an affidavit. It wasn't a contract because she didn't enter into an agreement with anyone. I had no idea how I was going to feel. I mean, up until the day I went to the hospital, I thought I would be fine. She was born. The first day was okay. And then, you know, by the next morning, I can remember being in the hospital and just being bewildered almost. Like, what is happening here? I mean, what is happening here? And like watching the nurses teaching, you know, her dad how to give her a bath and like realizing that they had to teach him how to give her a bath because it first wasn't natural and second because I wasn't going to be there to do it. Then my OB came in and just asking a couple questions about like how I felt. And then I can remember them all walking out and him walking out and then taking three steps backwards and looking at me and just not speaking, but mouthing to me, are you OK? And me just being like. No, no. This is someone that watches babies be born every day. And he saw it. He, who's, you know, delivered probably thousands and thousands of babies. I mean, he delivered my almost 16 year old. And that he saw, you know, that he could see, like, he, he better than anybody else, I'm certain, sees that connection between a mother and her baby. And this was the first time he'd ever seen anything like that before. I was also seeing my daughter holding this baby, and she wasn't okay either. She loved babies. I mean, what was I thinking? I had had two daughters at that point, and when my second daughter was born, it was the biggest thing that had, that had happened in her life. It was like the best thing in the whole world to her. How on earth did I think that I could just give one away and that she would be okay with it? In retrospect, she's very young, but why didn't I ask her? Like, why didn't I ask her? Because I'm certain that she would have said, no, <laughs> I'm not okay with it. That's when it all occurred to me, like, whoa, it's more than me and it's more than them, there are so many other people involved. One of the things that's interesting to me is that people don't think that babies know their own mothers. They don't think that it makes any difference to them who the mother is. And yet, we know that if you go out in the country and you see a whole flock of sheep, that little lamb out there is going to be able to find its own mother. Human babies are as smart instinctively, and yet we take human babies away from their mothers right at birth a lot of the time. And I think we need to pay more attention to what we're doing with new neurological sciences. They're going to find out that these babies are much more aware than we give them credit for. As wonderful as other people might be as parents, the baby knows that that's not the mother they were expecting. Sometimes it, it works out really well and sometimes it's more problematic. Surrogacy is moving away from traditional surrogacy. The traditional method is where the woman not only provides her genetic material, her eggs, but also her womb. The shift seems to be more toward gestational surrogacy, where the woman only provides her womb. And the egg can either come from the intended mother or it can come from a donor. Calling a mother a gestational carrier is a euphemistic way of dehumanizing her and taking away the relationship by removing the word mother. One of the problems of surrogacy is this intentional not bonding 
between the mother and the child. Surrogacy demands that she not bond with that child. You hear a lot about adult desires and adult wishes and adult needs, but a lot of times we're just not talking about what is in the best interest of this child. There are many things happening those nine months in the womb, many important things that are happening those nine months that just can't be casually dismissed. I um, went to my regular doctor appointment and I described some weird feelings I was having to my doctor. And she says, you need to drive yourself directly to the hospital. Later that evening, Marvin showed up, and to my surprise, his friend, Vom, came along. I, I didn't know why he was there. I stayed in the hospital for another nine or ten days before the babies were born. I started having the same contraction-type feelings again. I was right exactly at 31 weeks along, so they were nine weeks early. Marvin showed up fairly soon, discovered afterwards that his friend, Vom, had also come and was in the waiting room. Because it was a C-section and I'd had an epidural, when they took the babies out, Marvin, of course, followed with them, but I couldn't um, because they had to close me up. So it was many hours before I got to see my children. And later that evening, when I was going to visit the babies, one of the hospital social workers showed up. And she just trailed along, you know, observing uh, while my friends and I went to see the babies. Then she followed us back to the room. And when we got back to the room, she's like, well, I'd like to speak with you privately, if I may. She said, I understand we have a surrogacy situation here. And I looked at her and I said, what? I'm not a surrogate. What are you talking about? She said, Mr. McMurray and his partner called the hospital to speak with me um, and asked me to meet with them because you were just a surrogate for their their children, for them. And I'm like, you're, you're wrong. That's not right. I'm not a surrogate. I'm their mother. I, I haven't signed any surrogacy documents. I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm the mother. Things just... Uh, escalated from there. Their argument, as I understand it, is that a unmarried woman has to adjudicate her parentage just like an unmarried man. It's kind of novel. They argue it's an equal protection violation underneath the Constitution that a woman gets the unilateral ability to become a parent simply by giving birth. A man doesn't get to do that. There's a bias in the law and it's an equal protection violation. Okay, well, when you look through all the ways to adjudicate paternity, an unmarried woman using donor eggs is not the mother, just like the father would not be the father if he's not genetically related. Simply by giving birth under the Texas Family Code, the mother-child relationship is established by a woman giving birth. It doesn't say may be or can be or will be. It is established. They were her children. In this case, the judge issued the temporary restraining order that was drafted by the father's attorney. It was just typical in family law cases. I have visitation um, three times a week. They're appealing the decision that Cindy is the mom. This is a situation that we find ourselves in with novel technologies. In many jurisdictions, there's no law at all that speaks to how to resolve disputes that arise. So a lot of times what courts have to do is just draw analogies to the adoption context, or they have to simply look at the, the vital statistics laws. And in Texas, for example, the court just said, our law doesn't really speak to this. What it declares is that the woman who gives birth to the baby is the mother. That's as much as the law says, and that's all the court can do. So this is a very chaotic and unsettled area of the law because it's a state level issue, uh, along with the law that governs assisted reproductive technologies more generally. There's no federal overlay that governs this. Each state can decide for itself, but in many instances, there's simply nothing on the books at all. During the next month, um, our relationship uh, declined. I had no money, I had no job, uh, I had no place to live, and uh, I was being refused to see my children. My lawyer told me that I, I was the mother, uh, I did have rights, and that no judge would deny me the rights to my children. The judge did rule that I was the mother of the children. So far, those rights don't uh, seem to mean anything. I only get the children every other weekend. I'm not involved in, in their schooling or any decisions made uh, about the, the children. I went into labor at about 32, 33 weeks, and they were able to stop it. And then I went into labor again at about 35 weeks. I was already dilated and ready to deliver. And so I told mom and she's like, oh, my sister's coming in town, we're gonna be there. And then that was it, I didn't hear from her. About 12 hours later, I, um, I did 
finally hear from her and she said, I'm too sick to come. I, I can't come, I'm too sick. And then she had told me that her husband had been in the waiting room over the night. And I said, why didn't I know? Why didn't he come in? And at this point I'm crying. And I said, please, this is your son. This is your son's birthday. And uh, somebody should be here for him. I said, will you please ask dad to come in the room? She's like, well, I don't know how he feels about that. And if he wants, he's queasy. And I said, please. And uh, so I, dad did come in the room. I was very upset. I was angry. And I was so sad for this little boy. I did convince dad to stay in the room. Um, during delivery and dad cut his cord. They took him over to the warming table and they cleaned him up and they were getting ready to walk out of the room and I said, please, can I please see him? And uh, the nurse had picked up the baby and brought him over to my side and just held him up and I about jumped out of the bed trying to get a look at him. And that was it, I walked out. I have never seen or heard from them since. I think about him every day. We all left the hospital together and went home. And then that night, they took her to the hotel, their hotel room and kept her overnight at their hotel room. I also, at no point in time, took into consideration or thought about like how it would affect her. From being a baby and spending, you know, nine months in my womb and then five days in my arms and then being taken away, going from a perfectly happy baby to a baby that's, you know, colicky and screaming for hours and hours every single night. She was like that for months. I mean, a couple of months up until her baptism. But when I went out there, the first time that I would have seen her after she was born it was about two months later. And I'd been there for, you know, not very long at all. And I was holding her and she fell asleep on my chest almost immediately. I mean, with me, she was more than happy to be cradled and held and she would sleep on me. So not only how difficult it was for her as a newborn to be separated from the only thing that she knew and was comfortable with, but how it would affect her as she grew up. The primal wound is what happens when you separate a baby and its mother. Um, babies know their own mother through all their senses and when they, for some reason, the baby is separated from that mother, the prenatal bonding is interrupted there is a, a trauma that happens to both the baby and the mother. And they both feel as if something is missing within them. They know something's different, something's wrong, something doesn't feel right. And it's after they find papers or do something like that, they feel betrayed and they feel relieved because they have this understanding now why they felt as if they didn't fit in. My adopted mother was South Korean, so it was somewhat obvious that some of the pieces of the puzzle didn't fit. I'm obviously not half Korean. My adopted mom and I never had that connection that really made sense of a mother and daughter. The three of us didn't have that healthy family dynamic, so it was just a relief to find out why and to know the truth. The first picture of myself that I have, my birth mom gave to me, and it's actually of the exchange in the lawyer's office. She turned me over at the lawyer's office and they signed all the paperwork. Most of the consideration within surrogacy is towards the adults and what they want and what they're looking for. I don't feel like it's always in the best interest of the children. The first question I would ask in this context is, what are the goods we're trying to promote? What are the harms we're trying to avoid? And the obvious harm that immediately occurs to me, the just sort of low-hanging fruit uh, harm, would be, what about the kids? How are they to uh, understand themselves? Are there any psychological harms that would follow from one legal regime versus another? Uh, are there physiological harms? Obviously, this is deeply bound up with IVF itself, and there are still interesting and hard questions about you know, the safety of IVF, not just for the children who are born through these interventions, but also with respect to the, the women uh, who are involved as well. If you read the Baby M case from New Jersey, of course it's an older case, and it deals with traditional surrogacy. The New Jersey court talked a lot about the well-being of the child and expressed very serious concerns about social harms as well as individual harms that might result from a widespread practice of surrogacy. We don't have a lot of good evidence, a lot of good empirical evidence on the question of what are the harms short term and long term with respect to children or anyone who's involved in this process. And it seems to me if you're confronted with the possibility of real serious harms, a prudent thing to do for the legislature would be to try to pause for a moment, impose a moratorium, 
and conduct very serious and deep and searching inquiry into what the harms are. It seems irresponsible to me to push full steam ahead with a project that could risk serious harms that we don't even know about. Courts have to ask hard questions, and I think it's the right question, what are the best interests of the child? We are in an age where this technology is growing by leaps and bounds, and if we are careful with it, and careful with the words that we use in explaining these stories to these children, the take home that I would like them to have is that you were so deeply wanted and loved. My professional belief is the right way is that there are no secrets. It should not be anonymous. Secrets are like ticking time bombs. They will go off, it's just a matter of when. Everyone should know their beautiful story of conception. What I do believe is important is being honest and forthcoming and doing it early so that they have a good understanding of that um, from a very early age. When you look at surrogacy, what you look at are, you know, a couple that wants a child and then you have someone that's willing to have the child for them. Other times you also have other people, egg donors, sperm donors. There's a ton of people that get involved. But I think that what's never addressed and what's all too often not thought about is the child. This child's foundation of existence is a contract, an agreement, and more often than not money. That's not in the best interest of a child at all. We shouldn't be able to accept money in exchange for our child. I'm a longtime women's rights advocate and feminist leader. I have been particularly interested in issues related to the commodification of women and their bodies. There's also uh, a spectrum of uh, positions in the feminist community on the whole issue of women's choice, uh, women's right to do whatever they choose with their bodies, and of course the um, natural parallels here are prostitution and pornography, with some women's rights advocates saying that if a woman chooses to sell her body sexually through prostitution or through pornography, you know, she should be free to make her own choice and do with her herself, her life, and her body as she chooses. Given the fertility industry's huge profit-generating capacity and their need for constant inputs, be that women providing their eggs or women providing their bodies, and it's not just their uterus, you know, that they're providing because in the course of a pregnancy, a woman's entire body, every system, every organ is involved in the development of that fetus. So it is not just her uterus that she's renting, it's her entire body, as well as the entire nine-month period of her life. It has to do with the commodification of human organs. So to pay a woman money to rent her uterus, to rent her ovaries, to risk surgery and death is the equivalent of donating a kidney. Obviously we feel sympathetic to people who are infertile, but we should also feel sympathetic to poor women who are not making robust free choices to do this. There has been a, a great deal of, of commentary that seems to suggest the most typical person who chooses to be a surrogate are people who are in poverty or living in, in diminished socioeconomic circumstances uh, and who need money. And this is even more true if you talk about the overseas context and you're talking about poor women in India who are being conscripted. And these are women who in many instances are illiterate and they sign the, the authorization forms with a thumbprint. Out of concern for surrogates in India who have recently died, India has cracked down their laws. So, for example, you must now be a heterosexual married couple if you want to come to India and contract for surrogacy. You must be coming from a country that recognizes surrogacy contracts. We actually hired a crew and went to India to try to get these women's stories. But at one point on one day of filming, it was clear that the agency was suspicious that the questions being asked of the surrogates made them believe that our film crew wasn't in favor of surrogacy. So the film crew actually had their camera equipment damaged and they took the film from the crew. Another day we set up a day of shooting with surrogates in India, but they were heavily monitored by the agency that sat hovering by and the film crew sensed that the women were just giving talking points about how great they were treated and how wonderful it was to be a surrogate in India. What we've seen now since the Indians have changed their laws and made it more restrictive is that the market is shifting to Thailand and to Mexico. 
it was harder for me to let go because I did bond with him. I did make that motherly connection. I felt like the mom with this little boy. I had to be the mom, and I felt this need to protect him. It was my job to protect him from the world. The whole world was against him. I made that connection with him. I made that bond, and uh, I, I don't regret it. I don't believe that should happen in surrogacy. I mean, when they're still in the hospital, when they're still, you know, confused and so on and so forth, they want them to sign those final papers. The longer they give a person to think about these things, the better. I just don't think anybody owes anybody else a baby. It all fell apart when she was about six months old. They took her and moved and I didn't know where they were. I didn't know where she was for months and months and months. Um, private investigators to find her. And from there it went right into the courts. She wasn't an idea anymore that we could, you know, write out on paper. She wasn't an idea anymore. She was a real baby. I think all surrogacy should be banned. It's buying and selling of children. The surrogate is not uh, regarded as a human being. I've been actually classified as um, an incubator. I've been discussed. I don't have a name. I have been said that I, I am a surrogate uterus. Having to try to find a way to build a family outside the normal channels is very stressful for everyone. And I think it's very difficult for us to stand in judgment of what they're doing in terms of whether it's right or wrong or whether they should or shouldn't do it. We just try to make sure that we're doing the best job we can from our end of things medically and in the laboratory to create the best possible opportunity for them. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't always work. What we really have seen in, in our work is that a family is love. And long gone are the days where we have a mom and a dad and two children. And, uh, you know, we live in a society now where divorce is very prevalent. We have a lot of uh, divorced families, single parents, children being raised by grandparents, same-sex families. I think it's important that we continue to do research um, in all aspects of uh, IVF and to look at the um, research that's done. You know, what, what kind of problems did we encounter and uh, take it from there. I do believe it can be a wonderful, beautiful thing, but for the cost a woman can pay, you know, for things that do happen, it's not worth it. I told both couples in the very beginning, I'm not looking to perform a business transaction. I feel like with the second couple, right from the get-go, it was a business transaction. They wanted to pay somebody to have their baby. I do, looking back, feel like these children were bought. So often when the subject of surrogacy is treated by the mainstream media, uh, almost the exclusive focus is on the gift of life. Here's some infertile couple, uh, you know, that desperately wants to have a child, has been unsuccessful in attempts to do so, and here is this wonderful, altruistic, caring, loving woman that agreed to serve as a surrogate for them. It's known throughout the world as the Wild West of third-party reproduction and is also the reason why the United States is second only to India in supply of surrogates because it's virtually anything goes. In Europe, which is the closest approximation to culturally, societally, governance, politically, to the United States, a surrogacy is considered an illegal medical procedure. So you have people of means be they gay or straight, that desire to have a biologically related child and they consider it an entitlement. So what do they do? They must, by definition, prey upon financially vulnerable women who are desperate for economic means. I personally am 100% against it. I don't understand the purpose of it. I believe that there are too many children who need homes in this world. There needs to be more education on the downfalls of surrogacy. I think that it's too easy to look at surrogacy from the point of view of what are my wants, what are my desires, and how do I get them met. But it's, 
a lot harder to look at how it could possibly affect a child. My babies are wonderful. They're so gorgeous. They're just uh, so sweet natured. Um, sweet-tempered people say, well, it's costing you a lot of money. You know, you're not genetically related to your children. <laughs> you could walk away, get paid as a surrogate and adopt. And I'm here to tell you, you can't do that emotionally. There's no way I can walk away from my children. I think it's important that we listen to and hear these stories. Women aren't just empty vessels. The womb isn't arbitrary. We are at risk of creating a subclass of women just to gestate babies. Women aren't breeders, and we need to consider the children. I can remember being in my car and driving on my way to the airport, and I don't even know how the conversation came, but what we were talking about, when she was around five, she was really caught up and focused on looks. We have the same hair, Mom. We have the same eyes, Mom. This is what I have that's like my dad, and this is what I have that's like you. I mean, like, every day. I mean, when she was here, the, her whole visits were full of talking about the ways that we were alike, the ways that we were different, the ways that she looked like me, the ways that she didn't look like me. And then talking about my other three children, and they, they don't have the same hair as me, and they don't have the same eyes as me. And in her little head, not being able to understand it, and she looked right at me and said, just as innocent as could be, we have the same hair, and we have the same eyes. Why did you give me away and keep them? five years old. And her connection is, but we look alike, Mom. Why did you give me away? <laughs>